Today is um, Jugraj Singh, founder of Basics of Sikhi. He's a former serving British soldier. Um, and we're going to ask him, Baisab, how do you feel serving, risking your life for Britain? But yet, Britain is not quite representing you and your calm and your community with the same, they're not really reciprocating your level of loyalty, Paji. I think uh, we have to understand, that, I, mean, I, I would not discourage anybody from joining the British Army. Uh, I recruited for them. Uh, there's people now that are in the British Army because they met me when I was recruiting for the Army. Yeah. And I was in the Army. So I still think it's a good profession for us Sikhs to look into uh, and learn from. Um, there's a lot of skills there, a lot of discipline, a lot of life skills that the Pant needs that come in the Army. And also I do see that broadly the British Army is a force for good. The problem here is that most the army has to be understood that it's not an independent organization. Of all the organizations in this country, it can't go on strike. The police can go on strike, uh, the, uh, the firemen can go on strike, but the army cannot go on strike. The army must follow exactly what the politicians tell them. So in that way, you, can, you, can, you can't say, well, they can follow a legal order, but they tend to follow what they're told to do depending upon the briefing that they've been given. And you might have seen this week that I spoke to people out on the streets uh, and got their opinion. I did. And that most, of did. The, most of the Sikhs and also, uh, I think, uh, the public would be of the same view that what we need to find out is what was the briefing that was given to Margaret Thatcher. Um, we have to bear this in the context that has happened 30 years ago. The army has changed a lot since then. Um, and also bear in mind that most of the time what the army does is listen to the politicians, get the brief, they want to go out there, do what they can and come back. I personally don't think the SAS guy drew up the plan for the big army attack that happened. Yeah? I think probably what he would have given advice is for a small insertion to effectively assassinate Santaji. But I don't think Indira Gandhi wanted that advice. They might have fobbed off the, they might have said, yes, yes, we listen to your advice and we'll take it into account. Because had they said, no, we're not going to listen to your, your advice, that would have had alarm bells ringing because the advice would have been sensible advice. The thing here is that we failed in the last 30 years uh, to get that narrative of the premeditated attack and the questions about why were 41 other Gurdwaras attacked, mm. um, the whole build up from 47 to the Subha movement at Tarambiyud Morcha, 84. We failed to get that across to the Indian population and also to our population. So when you talk to people of my parents' generation, you've already, you've already got a massive split of people that says, oh well, Santaji was X, Y and Z, the, gen you know, the movement was X, Y and Z. We haven't really taught the narrative to our youth of what is our version of events. And also, we haven't taught that to the Indian people. Um, so really, because of that fail failure to show what our view is, we find ourselves now, 30 years later, having to then fight against this massive amount of propaganda last 30 years saying, oh no, Santaji was this, Santaji was that, um, the Sikhs were doing this, the Sikhs were from Khalistan. And you know, you know, Lord Singh's made very good points and so has um, Gurmukh Singh Ji. But those points, like you said earlier, we're still amongst our Punjabi community. Those points aren't in the public. Most of our parents, our Gurdwari, do present this in a very hot-headed hot -headed manner, without the facts. So I think what we need to do... Um, I mean, if we can learn anything from this, is that A, this issue is pretty much dying in the press already. I would say it's pretty much cold. We, for us, it's, it's we're heating up about it, but already in the press, the world has moved on. Why is that? Because we haven't got a good publicity team. We haven't got a good, uh, you know, we haven't got a uh, sort of press relations organized across the country. We are lacking in investment in press, just in just having relations with the press and having publicity. There's no PR company I know that works for the Sikhs, yeah? And PR is essential. So if you don't fund something, you don't get anything. Like they say, you know, if, you get, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, yeah? So if we don't spend money on PR, if we don't spend money on publicity, if we don't spend money educating our youth and our public and the wider public, then this is what we'll end up with. And the thing is, is Maharaj is telling us in Bani many, many times already, Karmi Aapu Aapani, what you, Jo Bijay, 
जैसा बीजे सोई लेने सो वो वी सो सो शॉ वी वो वी सोन सो फॉर इज इनवर्ड थिंकिंग इट्स लक ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एजुकेशन लक ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट इन प्रेस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड दिस इज द फल दिस इज द फ्रूट ऑफ दैट वी नो वी आर वेरी बैडली रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पॉलिटिक्स वी आर ओवर रिप्रेजेंटेटिव इन सो ऑफ थिंग्स दर आर इन बिजनेस बट दैट डजेंट ट्रांसलेट इन टू एजुकेटेड um you know uh press team when they went to south of gurdwara they interviewed some kid on the street you know that was prime time bbc television right and unfortunately we should have had somebody who was fluent in english and giving the view that hold on this proves that the attack was premeditated if anything we can take from this the one thing we to keep on banging on about is that brad and ks okay, bob and he came over here is a complete liar because he kept kept saying even now that the reason that uh, the attack was on because it was a last minute attack we've got proof and we've always had proof from lk from general sinha that the attack was premeditated if anything if you just keep singing the same song she the pra- attack was premeditated talk about the replica of the golden temple those are the kind of things that are very poignant things that people will remember that india and actually in india this is the point that needs to be made that the india need to understand that they were duped i think problem is we keep when we talk about khalistan if an indian hears the word khalistan it's like they've gone deaf you almost like the when you were to say the word khalistan they stop listening to anything you're saying anymore you know all they hear is these guys want to break up mother india these guys want to destroy india so they stop listening to you so as a pr campaign any pr if if a pr person was sitting here and i'm not a pr person i'm 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 a, but if there was they will say look this word is going to avoid any more conversation with you and they're going to put you in the trap of separatists and they will stop listening to you so my my response to this and this is what there's videos on the channel is that if the sikhs are going to do anything in india it needs to involve with taking taking part in india itself yeah as in take part in politics of india and if really is to say guru gobind singh's bachan which is delhi tak pe baithegi aap guru ki fauj if we're going to do anything then our plan should be that the fauj the khalsa should be in politics democratically getting elected and spreading out all over india so there's a khalsa raj in india to have that view then you need to get rid of the idea of one small bit of punjab that's khalistan and start thinking about khalsa raj and then you can start engaging with the indian public to say we're not here to split up india what we're here to do is point out the facts the indira gandhi and all the politicians effectively duped all of you lot into thinking that we were separatists when in reality all we were asking for was the anandpur sahib resolution which is a socio economic uh, resolution which is trying to give rights to punjab that were you know within federal india should have been guaranteed to india we've basically lost the pr battle yeah we so, lost it t- 30 years ago and we've continually losing it with because we haven't really thought about our situation in the in the light of what guru sahib is saying guru sahib never wanted small little punjab for ourselves their their hukum was always ki tabe khalsa ude astalo jita from east to west so khalsa raj is what we what we are here for if we say raj ke khalsa then our mission should be raj ke khalsa so aiming thus we've been sold khalistan and what most people think is khalistan is a small bit of punjab which is a third of what it used to be and probably a fifth of what it used to be under the whole of punjab So why are we aiming for this little bit of a job? So personally I think the if the focus should be on educating the youth and getting the narrative sorted out that we can teach our youth exactly what happened so a uh, professor uh, Gurmukh Sankal uncle, uncle was saying starting from 47 and beforehand from 20s really how we were we been tricked and tricked and betrayed and betrayed to where we found ourselves in 1984 and since then even further is what's happening in Punjab now that narrative needs to be taught and secondly to all oh, to to how we're going to teach that to the wider public so the indians and the british or the west and thirdly what should our aim be we need to really get together and figure out what our aim should be because every time you every time somebody stands up like me and says i don't think we should go for khalistan straight away you get criticized say why are you not why are you against the gun? but i would say i mean this is my i would say that if you want to if you want a small bit of khalistan then you're a small khalistani if you want the whole of india then you are a bigger khalistani me <laughs> makes sense to me for for us the khalsa raj should be the at least india you know
So I think that's if we if we got into that mentality, then we could engage with the Indians. Okay. It's not happening um, because we're, as you say, we're maligned as secessionists and terrorists and anti-patriotic and all the rest of it. Um, but Baji, you touched on um, the integrity of the hero of Operation Blue Star, Kuldeep uh, Singh Brar, or uh, Bulbul, as he's commonly referred to in India. Um, I've got a quote here. Um, it was from this week, and um, it was actually used by David Cameron in, in Parliament. Um, I'm not sure whether he's trying to use it as a fig leaf to cover for an inadequate uh, inquiry early doors or whether he was just genuinely just using it as a passing comment. I don't know. But uh, this is the quote itself. It says, uh, I'm quite dumbfounded because the operation was planned and executed by military commanders in India. There is no question we never saw anyone from the UK coming in here and telling us how to plan the operation. I conducted the operation and no aid came in. This is the first time I am hearing all this. It is obviously some mischief at some stage or the other. There was no aid given, no advice given. There was no representative from the UK government who came and met us to help us plan the operation. That's KS Bra this week speaking to the Indian press. Uh, I've got another quote here from the 12th of October 2012, uh, also to the Indian press. Uh, in this one, he describes the night of the 31st of May, 1984, 24 hours before he was shipped to Amritsar to conduct Operation Blue Star. So we drove from Meerut to Delhi. I caught the morning flight from Delhi to Chandigarh. I arrived in Chandimandar and told my wife that I'll be back in the evening and we'll catch the flight to Manila. I'm rushed to the operations room, maps on the wall, and I'm still wondering what's going on. I am told, you know the situation in Amritsar is very bad. And I said, yes. The Brigadier General Staff gave me a briefing, and it appeared to me that I am being sent off to carry out an operation. So in the middle of all those briefings, I said, uh, Sir, I am proceeding abroad tonight. I have been sanctioned annual leave for my honeymoon. And so he looked at General Dial. And they whispered to each other, and then he said, Bulbul, your leave is off. You go another time. There is an aircraft waiting for you outside to take you to Amritsar. Give your orders to your division to move from Mirut to Amritsar immediately. I give you 36 hours to settle down there and make your plans. I shall come there for my first briefing. The temple has to be cleared at the earliest. Time is at a premium, and Khalistan could be declared any day. Now, according to K.S. Bra, Khalistan could be declared any day was one of the determining factors of whether Operation Blue Star had to be rushed, had to be botched, had to be done within the first week of June, or not at all. His justification of Khalistan being declared is mentioned nowhere in the white paper of July 1985 published by the government of India while Indira Gandhi was still the Prime Minister. Khalistan is not mentioned anywhere there. But David Cameron has quoted a man who will now go, now go down in the annals and the publications of Hansard, as mentioned in the mother of all democracies, the Parliament, House of Commons of, of the UK. Does he deserve to be there? Um, no. He's, 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 he's on record as being as a liar. I think the problem here is that the, everybody's grasping for straws, you see. When you're, when you're, even if you're drowning in the water, you're trying to grasp at something to say, save me, save me. And because he's the general, because he has the name, then his word is being used. And I think this is the same thing that the press are doing. The press are, not, are being very shoddy. They're not checking their sources. They're not working out this person is trustworthy enough to quote. Um, the same with the press has been saying only fi up to 500 people were killed and then some people are claiming there are, or Sikh people are claiming there are thousands you know if you read the, if you watch that um, we did a news review off the news um, there's so many times that independent organizations yeah, have written uh, articles proving in and again that thousands of people died in, in June 1984 um, and every time you see the press using they use the official figures no one in India trusts the official figures the Indians don't trust what the government is saying. 
Yeah, because they know that they're lying. So why are British newspapers using the Indian figures? The same way with no one in India believes what anybody writes officially because they know that they're paid to lie because if they know the truth, they'll be out of a job. So, uh, you know, Kuldeep Singh Brad, or the Kuldeep Brad, he's really an untrustworthy source and I think David Cameron should really think twice before using his words because, as you said there, he hasn't actually planned the operation. He was given it last moment. Mm. So it felt to him like it was last moment. But actually, this was a very long and you know, long-term plan organization, uh, uh, um, a system, especially given that uh, General Sinha has said that he refused to carry out the attack, given that he'd been told to plan it, but he refused to. The, the model of the, the Dune Valley was made you know, 18 months prior to this. Um, I think what this comes back to, your point really is the date of June 1984. I don't think many people in our Pant actually go and find out why was that date of June chosen. Yeah? The government narrative given to Brar there was Khalistan could be declared at any moment. What we find out from reading stuff like Reduced to Ashes by um, Ram Kumar, uh, sorry, what was his name? Ram, Ram. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ram Kumar. 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 I had the pleasure of listening to him when I was in India. He's passed away now. His, his uh, PDF has been, um, the, the, his report is online or under insaf.org, so you can yeah. download it. It's on the video and the links as well. Reduced to ashes. What he says quite clearly Reduced is, and, and in fact, this is something that the um, NSYF does a bit little work on their documents as well. In June, what was happening was that the, uh, after the Tarambiyud Mocha wasn't working, yeah, in fact, we were working, the people were getting arrested, but the demands were not being met. More and more, we were being declared as separatists and Khalistanis. In the end, the people that were heading up the Mocha, San Longawala and those people, they decided, right, what we need to do next is stop all taxes being paid to the Indian government and stop all um, grain shipments out of Punjab. Because India is the breadbasket of, of uh, Punjab, Punjab is the breadbasket of India, and also yeah. India, the, the Punjab economy does contribute a lot in taxes. So what was happening is that from the 1st of June, they were going to stop paying taxes and stop grain going out. Yeah? And this was declared, this was, you know, it was written in other people, this was told to the government. And so what you see is that as soon as this happens, then the plan to invade the Golden Temple then gets stepped up, you see. And I think it comes back to what happened in November. Every time you hear the official police reports, I've just read a bit of who are the guilty that um, Lord Singh brought along with him. What you see is they wanted to teach the Sikhs a lesson. Yeah? And this comes back to the idea that the Sikhs were getting a bit too uppity. They thought they could stop India getting grain. They thought they could stop India getting taxes. And what they really wanted to do was break the back of the Sikhs. This is why June was chosen. They knew that there were going to be thousands of Sikhs inside Harmandir Sahib. And all they wanted to do was teach us a lesson. We need to get out of the way that they wanted to, you know, you know, uh, they wanted to attack and just happened to be that day. Of course it doesn't happen to be that day. It's like attacking the Vatican on Easter. Yeah. There's no way mm-hmm. you would choose to attack the Vatican on Easter. There's going to be thousands of civilians inside there. Any... Any person who gives advice would bear into account the date that it would happen. It's a religious place. It goes, has up peaks and troughs of people going in. And what this was, was a peak. So what was the reason that day was chosen? We need to understand it was designed to teach us a lesson. And obviously they didn't know what Sikhs are like. We're never going to learn that lesson. Yeah? That lesson is not something the Sikhs are going to learn. Yeah? That lesson is that Sikhs are going to come back at you. And that's what happened to Indra Gandhi in November. That she got killed. But... I think for us, why do they want to teach us a lesson is the question. Yeah? Because you see in India, Indira Gandhi, there's is, is an, is an art letter I read once from Nehru. Nehru is by the way Indira Gandhi's dad. We should remember that she's not um, any way related to Mohan Das Karamchand Chandi, Gandhi. She just picked that name. Yeah? She picked the name Gandhi. It's like me turning up and saying, you know what, I'd love to be called Thatcher. Yeah? And everybody starts thinking later on that I'm related to Margaret Thatcher. Now, obviously it wouldn't happen with Mayru, but still, in India, that's what Indira Gandhi is going to pass herself off. She's not Gandhi, she's married to a person whose surname is Khan. Yeah, so if you're going to call her, you might call her Indira Khan. However, beside the point, um, what happened with Indira Gandhi, she got written a letter when she was at Oxford uh, by her dad, Nehru. And Nehru said, for the sake of a group, one person can be sacrificed. And he said, for the sake of a community, one group can be sacrificed. And for the sake of a nation, a community can be sacrificed. This is Nehru's own words. So actually Indira Gandhi was thinking the same thing. She wanted to be in charge of India. 
She wanted to be Mother India, that was her aim. And so she saw the Sikhs as a good scapegoat, just like Lord Singh was talking about. And I think the way they want to teach us a lesson, it could have been any group, but the problem was, is that when she declared the emergency and she declared herself ahead of India, the Sikhs were the groups that the Sikh with the group yeah. that actually really protested against her declaring, declaring emergency. So that was the thing she wanted to teach us. That how dare the Sikhs stand up against me when I declare myself dictator of India. Who are these Sikhs? Only 2% of the population that are standing up against me. So the, the, the narrative of why, why the Sikhs were chosen to teach us a lesson was that, that the Sikhs were standing up for democracy. So given that India is a democracy, if we are to present this narrative to Indians, to say, look, we stood up for democracy. We got democracy working back in India. And then, then what did we get for that? The Indira Gandhi and the Sikhs, uh, the, Sikh, the Indira Gandhi attacked the Golden Temple and wanted to teach us Sikhs a lesson. And again, the same thing happened in June, to teach the Sikhs a lesson. And it's basically about teaching us that we have to kowtow down to the Indian hegemony, yeah? that we Sikhs are not allowed to be independent in, within India. But this was exactly the promise made to us in the 1920s. Nehru and Gandhi were making promises to us, saying that we will experience the glow of freedom within a federal India. So, you can't blame us Sikhs for then wanting to experience that glow, which was that was promised to us. Then they want to teach us a lesson for asking for what we were promised. So, this is national press, national media. This is the world that we have to take a look at. If we're going to do things that are at the national level, right? then we need money. It comes down to, it's very simple, the only way it works at a national level is that you invest into it. And that's the one thing that uh, uh, we, we, uh, I put up in that video, is that if we're going to do something, we need to invest. And the way to invest is to hire professionals. Yeah? People that can put their time and effort into this. If we keep doing part-time things, we're going to get part-time results. You know? If you look at any organization or any media savvy or, uh, you know, community, like, the, like for example, people always use the Jews, for example, yeah? but they invest in representatives, they invest in media. Yeah, yeah but no, I, understand, I, earlier, I understand what you're saying. If it's adequate, uh, are you happy with the results? Where do we take them? Do we take them to the UN? Do we take them to the Hague? Well, I think, I, I mean, I'm not against what Lord Singh was saying. I do think it's important to us, for us to have an international um, inquiry into the events. And the problem is, is that the Sikhs haven't actually carried out their own inquiry. I think the, the problem is our mentality seems to be going a bit wrong. If you are a nation without a state, like you said earlier, yeah. you behave like a nation. And any nation, even if it doesn't have a state, a physical la land, it still goes about conducting itself in a sovereign way. And the problem is the Sikhs are sort of to lose this mentality of being a sovereign nation. So even if we don't have land, you know, they're still, still sovereign. And the idea is that I, I believe what we should do is the Sikhs should launch their own inquiry. All the documents are out there, Carnage 84, HS Fulka has done so much work, Insaf has done so much work. Uh, last year NSYF produced so much documentation for the thing. I think we should conduct our own inquiry. And I think as a Khalsa, we should actually find out, if we've got a book here for saying who are the guilty, we should actually say these people are guilty and hold our own. You know, you've got the International Criminal Court. It, it, it tries people in absentia. Yeah, people that are not there, they get tried, even if they're not there, on the evidence. And I think first the Khalsa should try these people themselves. Yeah? And do it and hire people who are officially, you know, that independent maybe, people that are, um, you know, lawyers to present the information and just put it out on YouTube and show what these people did. Because the problem is that when you do something like this, which is documentation, you know, the majority of the world no longer reads. If you want to change the focus of what's been happening the last 30 years, you need to sort of wake up to the new media around us. The Coney thing was really good. If we started to present ourselves online, and in a way that was palatable to a Western audience, then we could get, and, and to the Sikh audience, the, the kind of youth growing up, then we get away from the rhetoric and the kind of anger-driven politics, and back to the cold, hard facts. And I think that's what we should do. We should act in a sovereign way and change our mentality, no longer seeing ourselves as victims, trying to get the UN to help us, trying to get this to help us. Actually, all the help we need is right here 
in our own bond, in our Guru Khalsa. So I think the Khalsa should, you know, should wake up to its own power. Um, we don't need the UN. We're not looking for David Cameron's Prasad. We're looking for, you know, the UN's Prasad. We're looking for Guru's Prasad. And the only way to get that is to start act, acting like a sovereign nation. Yeah? And do what Guru Sahib would have done. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what would Guru Gobind Singh you do in this situation? As a Khalsa, come together, work what that is, and then execute that mission. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't care what anybody else is saying. Work out what Guru Gobind Singh you would have done and do that. With that, my, you know, my Thank you. Bye, Guruji Ka Khalsa. Bye, Guruji Ki Fateh.